Good morning and welcome to the digital worship service of Calvary Baptist Church. I am Pastor Chuck and so glad that you've joined us this morning as we worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ together. <laughs> today we are going to be continuing in our study of the book of Habakkuk. We're actually going to finish up the book today and we're just excited to see what the Lord has in store for us this morning. As we prepare our hearts, uh, let's go before the Lord together in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for the goodness of your Son, Jesus. We thank you for allowing us to come before you this morning to worship you, to praise your name, to sit before your scriptures. We pray that the truth that you have in store for us, Lord, would penetrate deeply into our hearts. We pray that your Spirit would guide us through the process this morning as we look into your word and see what you would have us know. We love you and we praise you all in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now let's worship the Lord together this morning. So good to worship the Lord together. Uh, have you ever seen the Antiques Roadshow? Uh, I remember that as a show that as a kid, uh, when we would catch it on PBS and you'd just sit and watch it. And it was always amazing to see the people would bring in things just from their attics or that have been sitting around their home for years and years and years. And they would find out that it was worth, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And you sit there and you think about, you know, these people who would come in and they would bring a, a cabinet or some piece of furniture in. 
and you would have the inspector would start to look at it and they would begin to kind of you know pick it apart and they would look at all the damage that was on it, little markings and things like that. Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, people are blown away with just how much their junk is worth. Uh, there's one story I heard of a woman who had a baseball bat uh, that had been, you know, sitting under her bed. She was a, you know, she provided some kind of service. I don't remember what her job was, but she was kind of a freelance worker. And there was one gentleman who could not pay for whatever service she was providing and so he offered her this basket full of just baseball stuff gloves balls bats things like that and handed her this bat uh, and so you know reluctantly she kind of took it threw it in her house and you know let it sit there for a while and uh, all of a sudden one day going through it someone looked at this bat that was sitting under her bed and they said hey this has a signature on it well, she brought it in to someone who knew something about sports memorabilia and their jaw dropped because they said, oh, that signature is from Babe Ruth. And then they looked at the bat and they did some more research and turns out not only that, it was the bat that Babe Ruth uh, hit a home run with. And they had documentation, photographs, things that, yeah, that's the bat he used to hit a home run. Well, not only that, but this bat was actually the bat that Babe Ruth used to hit the very first home run in the New York Yankees' new stadium that was built during that time. And so just, I mean, astronomical amount that this bat was worth to those people all of a sudden. This thing that she had sitting under her bed for years turns out to be worth millions of dollars. I think the bat sold for $14 million, which she actually used to create a youth center in her area and is now doing uh, great work with kids. And it's just this crazy story. How could you sit there and have something so valuable and, and so great and so precious and, and all of a sudden it's just been sitting under your bed? And when you don't realize truly what something is, you tend to cast it aside. When you don't realize truly what something is worth, the value that it has, you tend to cast it away. And I think that we do that a lot of times with God. God is so accessible to us in today's age. We have the spirit that indwells us. We have the complete revelation of God. You know, to go before his presence, we need to do nothing more than just offer up a prayer to him. And there we are uh, before God in, in the holy courts of heaven. There we stand petitioning and bringing our request to him. Uh, we can do all kinds of things like that. And because he's so accessible, I think sometimes we misplace the idea that, that he is small and insignificant. How many times do you hear people saying like, oh, God's my best friend. God's my buddy. God's my pal. You know, God wants to be someone like that for you. And it falls so short of who God is and what God has done. Because if we have an accurate picture of God, we understand that, that if God were to show up here in front of us now, we would not be giving him a high five or welcoming him into our home or saying, hey, what's up, God? How you doing? We wouldn't be doing that at all. But we would be like Isaiah, falling prostrate before the Lord in fear and trembling. We would be terrified. We would realize the depth of our own sin. We would realize how small and insignificant we are. And we would be terrified that this great, good, pure, holy God would just wipe us out of existence forever. <laughs> because uh, we're so small, we're nothing compared to him. We're, we're so bad, we're so evil, we're so sinful, and we would bow before him in just utter, complete terror. And we need to remember that, that God is, is God, that God is powerful, that God is strong, that God is mighty, that God is worthy to be praised, that, that God is not just our friend and our buddy. No, he has drawn us close to him. He has purified us through the shed blood of his son Jesus. But, but he is not some trifle thing that we can throw around and play with as we see fit. So many of us take God and we wish that we could just take him and just kind of put him in our back pocket. Tuck him away when we don't think we need him or we don't want him seeing what we're doing. And then when we need him to pop up and perform for us, that we can all of a sudden take him out, offer up a prayer, and then get what we need. And that is not how the God of the universe works. That is not how the creator of all things interacts with his creation. 
He is not at our beck and call, but he reigns supremely over all creation. And, and that is the vision that Habakkuk has. That is, that is the response that Habakkuk has to the vision given to him by God as we look in Habakkuk chapter 3. As we remember in our study of Habakkuk, Habakkuk was told that the Babylonians were coming to slaughter the, uh, Judea, that they were going to come sack Jerusalem, cart people off for 70 years of the Babylonian captivity. And he was terrified by this. And God promised him that he would bring the nation low, but that that nation would not be brought low until after they completed the judgment that God was bringing on Jerusalem. And I want you to see how Habakkuk responds to God. I want you to see the, the prayer that he offers up, the praise that he offers up. Last week, we looked at verses 2, 1 and 2, where Habakkuk talked about how he heard the report from the Lord. That, and he was asking and begging God in the midst of the years, revive the works that you've done, revive those things that you have done. What we have carrying down from verses 3 through the end of the chapter is kind of a recount of what those works are. And they paint a picture of a God that is big, that is mighty, that is strong, that is powerful. And this is the God we worship. And so my hope and prayer this morning is that as we look through these texts, that the Spirit would open your eyes to see who God is, to how we, we, should, we should approach Him, and just give us a sense of awe and wonder of this God that we serve. Because God is mighty, God is strong, God is powerful, and He goes to war on our behalf, and He saves His people. And so that's what we're going to see this morning as we look into Habakkuk chapter 3. Starting in verse 3, the text here says, God came from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light rays flashed from his hands, and there he veiled his power. So the first thing we see here is that God comes in glory. The, the picture that we have here is of God marching towards Jerusalem, okay? Marching towards with his people. We see here it says the Lord came from Teman and that we see that he comes from Mount Paran. Now Teman has to do with the nation of Edom and Mount Paran has to do with the wilderness where we actually find Mount Sinai. And the idea here is that God is marching forth from Sinai going to Canaan to establish and save his people in that land. And, and look at the way that he comes. The scripture here says that as he comes, splendor covers the heavens. Have you ever seen the stars at night with no other like, light pollution? It's completely dark. It's a sight that I've never seen. I hope to see it. I want to get out west where there's just nobody for miles and miles, and you can just look up and see all the splendor of the sky. We are missing out on a beauty of God's creation by living in places where the lights are on all the time. But just imagine the, the beauty, have you ever seen photos of it? The beauty uh, of the, st the stars in the sky, the beauty that there is. And this is the point that, that Habakkuk is making in this song, is that when God shows up, when God marches from Sinai to Canaan, when, when God is marching along the way, that his splendor covers the heavens. In a sense, all that beauty and all of that grandeur and all that grace as we look to the heavenly sky is nothing compared to God. He is more glorious, more beautiful, more powerful, so that when we see God, the beauty of the heavens becomes absolutely insignificant. His splendor covers the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. All of creation praises the name of God as he marches from Sinai to the land of Canaan. It says that his brightness was like the light ray, was like the light rays flashed from his hands. This is the idea of almost like lightning shooting from his fingertips and, and light rays beaming from him. His glory is manifested in this world. He is beautiful to behold. And yet, with all of this power and with all of this might, what we see and all this glory, how does he finish up this little part of the passage? It says, and there he veiled his glory. 
So what we have here is a picture of God beaming light, shooting lightning from his fingers, rays of light going before him, his splendor filling the skies, the praise of him coming from all of creation, and yet his glory is veiled in that moment. It's just a glimpse of who he is. It's just a small, small piece of the beauty and the glory that is God. And, and that's what we need to understand is that our greatest imagination and our greatest concepts of the glory of God pale in comparison. It's like an iceberg on, on the surface of the water. You're sailing on the water and you see the tip of that iceberg just kind of popping up over the surface. And yet below it, going down deep, deep, deep into the water is just this massive chunk that you can't even see, that you can't even fathom. That is the majesty and the glory of God. The greatest that we can ever imagine is just the peak tip of the iceberg that is the fullness of his glory that we will never see. Paul writes about this idea in 1 Timothy chapter 6. It says that, that he is veiled in light. This God is veiled, that he's invisible. No one can see him, but he is glorious. And that's the image that Habakkuk is painting here, that God, when he comes, he comes in glory. What we're going to see in the next part of the scripture is that he not only comes in glory, but he also comes in power. Because look what happens when God marches from Sinai. Verse 5, the text says, Before him went pestilence, and plague followed at his heels. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. He was there. He, his were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. So God comes in power. God comes in might. God comes with great ability. It says that pestilence go before him and plague come at his heels. This is a reference to the curses that God told would befall the Israelites if they didn't follow him. All of pestilence and all of plagues, they are at the very command of God and he sends them forth out and they follow behind him to complete and accomplish his will and his purpose. And, and here you have this idea that God is going in and he has is, he is marched from Sinai into the land of Canaan. And now we have this reference to the Canaanites who plagued the land of Israel and came and conquered them and oppressed them. This people from Kushan and the place that we have the, Mid, the Midianites. These are both groups of people mentioned in the book of Judges. Uh, the people of Kushan were the people who first came and oppressed those who were living in the land. And the Midianites were a, a mighty force lording over the people of Israel. And yet what happens when God shows up? These warriors, these people who suppressed God's people, who oppressed them, who put them into slavery, who beat them down, who conquered them, what happens to them when God shows up? They tremble and they fear. The land of Midian trembled. The, the tents of Kushan, they were in affliction. They were afraid. They're terrified when God shows up. Why? Because God is powerful and mighty. And unlike any force that the world has ever known, unlike any force the world has ever seen, nothing compares to our God. This is how strong and this is how powerful he is. What we have in this section is God arriving to the scene of battle. And we're about to describe the battle that takes place between God and the enemies of Israel. But it says that he comes and he stands and he looks upon the earth. He measures the earth. He surveys the scene. He checks things out. And what happens when God sends his gaze to the people? It says that he looks and shook the nations. Just the very turning of God's attention towards these pagan nations causes their nations to shake and tremble and topple. We get images of Jericho as the Israelites were going through the land of Canaan and they stood before the city and they blasted their trumpets and the walls came tumbling down. Just God glancing and turning his gaze towards these nations and the lands shake. The eternal mountains scatter, the everlasting hills sink low, because in, Paris, in comparison to God, these eternal mountains and everlasting hills 
The idea that if you've ever seen a mountain in nature, it's going to look the exact same way your entire life because it's eternal, it doesn't change, it stands there. But what happens when God shows up? They scatter, they crumble, they sink low into the ground because nothing stands before God. Even the mountains that seem so permanent in their fixture fade away before God Almighty. This is the God that we worship. This is not a God that is just our buddy and our friend. This is the mighty creator of all things. This is, this is a God who reigns supreme over all things. And when he shows up to do battle against his enemies, his enemies tremble with fear. This is why it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Because if you fear the Lord, then you truly understand who he is and what he's about. He's not some pocket deity that we've created with our own minds. He is the Lord Almighty, and His is the entire creation. And we worship Him, and we praise His name, and yet we also stand in fear because of the power that is before us. So this is the picture of God we have. He comes in glory, He comes in power, and then He does battle. We see here in the next passage in verse 8, it says, Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers or your indignation against the sea when you rode on your horses or your chariot of salvation? You stripped the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. The raging waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. The sun The sun and the moon stood still in their place at the light of your arrows as they sped, at the flash of your glittering spear. You marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. You pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors. You came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters. So this is an intense battle that takes place. This is God taking action against the enemies of God's people. And there's a lot of imagery involving nature here. And so what are we seeing is it talks about was your wrath against the rivers and was your wrath against the mountains? And is God just throwing a temper tantrum and destroying rivers and mountains and doing those things? No, that's not the picture that's being painted. The picture that is being painted here is, listen, there is absolutely no physical barrier that can keep you safe from the wrath of God. You can't hide behind mountains. You can't hide behind rivers. You can't hide behind these things because God will come and he will save his people and he will pour out his wrath on the nations. And that's what Habakkuk is showing about God in these passages. It talks about the idea of God coming in on his chariots of salvation, splitting the seas and the waters and the surging of mighty waters. That's a pointing directly back to the Exodus. There, Israel stood before the Red Sea, and the Egyptians were coming right behind them. And what God is saying is that, listen, the mighty waters and the mighty seas of the world, they're no match for me. They cannot prevent my people from my salvation, and they cannot keep the enemies of my people safe in any way, shape, or form. So I will split them, and I will part them, and I will save my people. And that's exactly what he did. You look back to the Exodus, and and Moses led the people of Israel on dry ground through the Red Sea. And then when the armies of Pharaoh chased after them, the Red Sea closed in about them and destroyed the entire army of the Egyptians right then and there. God saves his people. And furthermore, he saves us too. There's an allusion here all the way back to Genesis 3, chapter 15, the proto-gospel. After Adam and Eve has sinned, God uh, sacrifices an animal, covers their nakedness, he pronounces judgment on them, and he says that one will rise and, and he will, the enemy will bruise your heel, but you will crush his head. And we see an allusion to that in this passage. 
The scripture here says in verse 13 that you went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. You pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors, who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. So understand the picture that's there. The picture is, is that here we have the enemies of God. And, and they're going forth with, with, with rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. They think it's going to be easy. They think it's going to be simple. But what does it say that God has done? God said you pierced them with their own arrows. You crushed their head and you pierced them with their own arrows, the heads of his warriors. And so what is it talking about here? What, what, are, what does it mean pierce them with their own arrows? Well, what is Satan's greatest weapon against us? What is Satan's greatest weapon against the people of God, against this world? What, what does he bring before God and accuse us of? That's what the name Satan means, the accuser. What does he accuse us with? He accuses us with sin, which brings about death. And then God used those very weapons against us to bring about our salvation because he became sin for us and he died on the cross. And therefore, sin no longer has power over us and death has no sting because we in Christ Jesus have life eternal. And so, so the same way that God is going to save and deliver his people... He has saved us because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And that's what Habakkuk is calling for. And that's what Habakkuk is asking for. He's asking for salvation. He's asking that in the midst of all the turmoil that's going to come, because the Babylonians are going to come take Israel. The Babylonians are going to come wipe them out. He's saying, God, you've saved your people before. You delivered us from judgment through the book of Judges. You delivered us from Egypt. You delivered us from the Midianites. You delivered us from all these foreign nations. Please do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. And yet he says these things full well knowing that nothing is going to stop the Babylonians from coming and wiping out Judah. And we know that because of how Habakkuk closes up his book. In verse 16 he says, I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like a deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. So here Habakkuk, after receiving the vision of what God will do, after hearing clearly that the Babylonians are going to come, he's filled with great fear. And, and this is what we need to understand is that fear and faith are not mutually exclusive. We can experience fear in this life and yet at the same time have faith that God will keep his promises. Because what was happening to Israel during this time period was terrifying. The Babylonians were not good people. It wasn't like the Roman captivity. You know, when the Romans would come in, they would conquer a nation, they would go to war, but then they would pretty much let people live their daily lives. Babylon, not so. The Babylonians were cruel. The Babylonians were merciless. And Habakkuk was afraid. He was so afraid. He, he says that I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. He is terrified. He feels like his body is wasting away. He is so afraid. His lip is quivering. He's trembling. He's shaking. There is a physical expression of fear in him. He's terrified. And he says, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. He knows bad times are going to come. He knows that they're coming. He knows that they're right around the corner. And he's terrified. And yet he will quietly wait for that day that God has promised when he will set all things right. 
He's quietly waiting for that day when trouble comes upon the people who are coming to invade him. After God is done with them, after God has completed his judgment. And look at the tremendous faith that he has. He says, even though the fig tree doesn't blossom, even though that there's no produce from the olive vineyard, even though we don't have any any livestock in the stables, even though the, the fields, they don't give us any food, even though we don't have any sign of goodness, any sign of prosperity, any sign of hope, any sign of wealth, any sign of security, any sign of happiness, even though all those things are gone, yet what does he say? I will rejoice in the Lord and I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Even when times are terrible, he says, I will rejoice in the Lord. Because, oh, God, the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on the high places. He makes me dance. He makes me sing. He gives me joy in life. And that is the sign of faith. That's a sign of faith, believing in what God has promised. God promised Habakkuk that, yes, the Babylonians are coming, but I will judge them and I will restore my people. That's the promise that Habakkuk had. And so Habakkuk said, I will wait for the day of trouble to come upon those who invade us. So what promises have we been given in Scripture? We've been given the Scripture that God is going to set all things right, that God will judge the wicked, that God will bring us into an eternity where we worship Him and praise Him forever. He will bring us to a place where He will wipe away every tear. Pain will be no more. Death will be no more and that we will live with God forever in peace and in joy. He's promised us that. He's promised us that he works all things out for the good of those who love him, as called according to his will. He said those things to us. And so now here's the question that we have as Christian, is that when things are bad, do we still believe that? And do we still have faith that God is doing what he said he would do? Do we have faith to say, Yes, God, I will wait quietly for the day when you answer your promises and you make all things right. And in the meantime, will I truly rejoice in the Lord? When you don't have enough money in your bank account, will you rejoice in the Lord? When you watch friends and family members dying and passing away, will you rejoice in the Lord? When you see the nation that we live in crumbling and falling apart around us, will you rejoice in the Lord and quietly wait for God to take up vengeance on those who are against his people and against his son? See, that's what we are called to do. We are called to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. We are told to, as, as we face the trials of various kinds, to count it joy, my brothers, understanding that God is at work in all of it. And that's the place that Habakkuk finally comes to. He comes to this realization and this acceptance of the fact that God is at work, that God is moving, and therefore he will rejoice and praise the name of the Lord. I get this picture of Habakkuk standing on the wall of Jerusalem, watching the army of Babylon march forward and lifting his hands and saying, praise you, God, for the good things that you do. Praise you, God, that you are merciful and good. And I will praise your name until the day that you decide to bring vengeance on those who invade us. What a faith that is. What a faith that that's modeled for us. So as you go out and you live your life, whatever circumstance that you are facing right now, you remember that God is sovereign, God is in control, and he is working all things out. God has promised us that he will set things right, and our job is to endure to persevere, to remain persistent in our praise, our worship, our thanksgiving, our joy in this life. Not because of the things around us, but because of the God that we serve, because the God that we serve is mighty and powerful. And remember what God told Habakkuk, the righteous shall live by faith. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this text, and we thank you for the goodness of your Son, Jesus. We ask, Lord, that you would guide our hearts in these troubling days. We ask, Lord, that you would fill us with your joy and your peace, and that you would help us to cling to you ferociously in this life. Thank you for your Son. Thank you for your Word. We pray these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day today, and God bless.